moment to kind of regress and and uh, hang out and socialize. Um, the speakeasy is just a little different because it's uh, you know the the bar that we open is is a very small bar. It's 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 thirty five seats. Uh, it's very dim uh, and it's sexy and and uh, you know we only really have you know you know two rules and it's not to be on your cell phone, uh, take a call or take a, a like a photo of the place. Uh, if you want to text, you want to Google, you can do whatever you want, but. Uh, we felt like we don't want flashes going on. We don't want people kind of putting, taking selfies or looking around, you know, uh, that kind of stuff uh, at the speakeasy. So I think it's just circumstantial. Would you rather go to a restaurant that tolerated or even encouraged technology or one that forbids it? Give us a call, 800-433-8850. You can send email to kojo at wamu.org or send us a tweet at Kojo Show. Tim, uh, you have not issued any smartphone edicts yet, but no. you have voiced concerns about this practice of snapping photos of dishes because it can be so disrupted, especially, I guess, in terms of time. All of a sudden, we're spending half an hour on our appetizer because we're so busy taking <laughs> pictures of it. Um, but why have you not yet uh, done anything? But at the same time, what are your concerns? You can't deny that it stretches out a meal, even for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, and at Maple Ave, we are actually even smaller than uh, the Shepherd. We're only 28 seats. And it's a 300 square foot dining room, like even smaller than the studio. And if somebody's sitting there and you know we have this dim lighting and all that, when somebody's sitting there and a flash goes off, At the same time, and I was telling Jessica this uh, when we initially did the interview, was that these people are also paying, they're renting a small bit of your space. That's what they're doing for their meal. an awful lighting or a half-eaten entree could also make you look really bad. It's like six of one and half a dozen of the other, isn't it? Well, and, and there are places like uh, Cork Wine Bar, they request no photos, and that's the reason, because they don't want their food looking bad. But my personal view on it is if you take a terrible photo that's fuzzy and dark and you post it for your friends to see, they're probably just going to think you're a terrible photographer, not necessarily <laughs> that the food is bad. And I think it's also really important to have those real photos out there. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, you know, some restaurant has sent me a PR photo with a gorgeous dish and it's garnished all nicely. And then you go to the restaurant and it looks totally different or, or worst of all, um, it's half the portion size or something like that. And so, you know, people want to see what real food looks like, even if it's ugly. Well, I don't know, Tim. Uh, if, in fact, the photo is taken by someone who is blurry-eyed themselves and the photo yeah. looks a bit blurry or it's a half-eaten meal and it doesn't look good, I don't know if you would have the same appreciation for it than Jessica's friends who happen to see it on her Facebook post. Uh, I do see it as, like, photographic word of mouth so that's their photographic opinion of your food and you know it, it is a great source of um, advertisement for your restaurant because 
it's a conversation starter. Somebody will see it on Instagram or on Twitter, and then we'll ask you about it. You know, oh, you've been there. How, how is it? I saw your picture, be it, you know, but ugly or, you know, just like a professional took the picture. It's still a way that you can ask that person, oh, how's the meal? And they can actually tell you how it tastes, which is probably the most important part on top of how it looks. Um, so I do see a, a lot of value in that and um, getting the word out there, be it just a single picture rather than like, you know, 140 characters or something like that. But Spike, if you see what Tim describes as but ugly pictures of your food, <laughs> how does that affect you? How does that make you feel about the people who are looking at that photo and the image they're getting of your establishment? Well, first off, I, I feel, I have to say that I feel like social media is just a very, very minute part of, uh, you know, the, the marketing and the publicity that, you know, and the people that actually uh, drive, uh, you know, drive people to your restaurant. I think word of mouth is still, uh, you know, the first and outmost uh, best way to kind of get the message across. Um, you know, I I'm not really worried as, you know, on a butt ugly picture of my food at Bernays or or Good Stuff Eatery. I mean, does it disturb me a little bit? Be like, yo, this <laughs> this guy needs a <laughs> photography course, you know? <laughs> yeah, I might say, I might say that, but uh, at the end of the day, I think we're a generation that that kind of uh, are we're used to being on our phones. We're you know we're we're doing selfies, we're sending emojis, we're taking pictures, and and we understand that it's not the true representation of that restaurant, the way the chef plated it up or or what have you. I think it's like you know we're all smart enough to to understand that. Um, you know, I just think overall, you know, I, I, I just read another article the other day uh, in the paper um, in how it's just getting a little bit out of control. And it's just I think it's it's just sad for our generation that, you know, whether you're walking through the airport or you're on a train or if you're in a restaurant, everybody is on the cell phone. Do you know what I mean? Everybody. And you, you miss like genuine moments where you can have, you know, a, a real connection with somebody and a conversation, uh, you know, at a restaurant. So I personally choose when I go to dine, I try to put my phone away as much as possible, right? I, I don't want to take pictures. I, I don't want to, you know, I really want to indulge with the, with the people that I'm having dinner with. And I, I you know, I want to enjoy the bottle of wine. I want to savor the food. I want to see facial expressions. And I really, really want to have like a nice evening. Uh, and I feel like you check out, you literally check out when the phone is in front of you. So personally, I say, hey, like, try to take it a little easier. Like, you know, ha enjoy your experience a little bit more. Don't be so frantic over the phone. You, you have the rest of your life to do selfies on a beach or, or what have you. I also think there's an etiquette part of it that needs to be respected. And we're going to make this a broader etiquette conversation yeah. in a little while, but go ahead. Yeah, like, you know. I, I wouldn't dare take my photo of my picture at Le Bernardin at, <laughs> at Erica Paris restaurant, right? There is no rules there, but I would not dare take a picture while the, the course is, is brought there because there's a style of a service and you're in the atmosphere, you're well dressed, you know, it's, it's kind of like that experience is completely different. So I think, you know, people should learn how to call each moment differently. Um, I also believe that there's rules at an establishment uh, it could be respected. If there is a no photo policy, don't take any photos. It's like being in a museum and it says, please don't take pictures of these of, of these paintings. Don't touch the big elephant. Well, let me tell you right. about the expression on Jessica Sidman's face. Just because a <laughs> restaurateur, restaur restaurateur says you're not allowed to take pictures doesn't mean that some diners, mm, uh, Jessica Sidman, are going to follow the rules. Of course not. Does it? Of course not. <laughs> Just I uh, broke the rules. <laughs> is there a discreet way to break the rule? Yeah, absolutely. And um, when I went to the Shepherd, I did, I did take photos. No flash, though. And I don't even think anyone noticed. Um, I was very discreet. But uh, and, and you, wrote, you wrote about it. How is that being discreet? <laughs> <laughs> uh, At the it, it, moment, it, it, it disrupted it, no one. <laughs> every, every single person that reads your article, which you're a great writer and a lot of people tune in to read, knows that you took pictures at a place that has a strict one rule, no photo policy. Right. And I did it to prove how, a point. How did you do it without getting busted? How do, I mean, I, I wasn't even being that sneaky. Well, we don't have like, we don't really have, we don't have like, yeah, we don't have photo police. It's just, it's, Maybe you need it's, it's suggested, like, please don't, don't take pictures. That's, that, that's it. Yeah. And, um, I, I mean, I did it personally to prove a point, which is that I think these kinds of policies are a little bit silly. And I agree, uh, with everyone that there is an obnoxious way to take photos in restaurants and there's also a 
discreet, polite way to do it. And I think the question really comes down to who's, uh, and, and it can also be distracting to the experience. I definitely agree with that. But the question is, is it the restaurant's job to police that and, and tell you that you you know you're not having enough face-to-face -face social interaction, or should you make that determination on your own? We're going to take a short break, and when we get back, we'll as, as I said broaden the discussion to the etiquette involved in all of this. But you can still call right now 800-433-8850. You can send email to koja at wamu.org. Send us a tweet at koja show, or go to our website and enjoy the live video stream of our conversation at koja show.org. I'm Kojo Nam. Sure. You know, typically I have to say that, you know, I agree with Spike. When I um, I was being able to catch a little bit of the, the show just before, you know, dining is about engaging with the people that you're with, whether it's a family meal with your kids, whether you're out with a client or you're just out with friends to enjoy yourself. It's not really about trying to bring extra people to the table via that smartphone. Um, you know, every now and then, yes, I get that we live in a world where you have to check with the babysitter or the boss calls with an emergency. And I think that that can complicate things, but I think we have to be smart about how we handle those types of situations. I think there have to be exceptions. And I think generally, the idea should be to plan to put that phone away. I like to tell people that it's not a utensil you need to eat your food. So <laughs> um, don't even put it on the table or it becomes tempting you know, to, to, to look and see who that text came in from. And now you're really looking distracted. And frankly, I think you really are distracted. 800-433-8850. Does your family have specific rules about devices at the dinner table? Tell us how you adapt your rules to new distractions. 
433-8850. Send us email to kojo at wamu.org. But Anna, there's also this. The issue gets a little more complex when we bring children into the mix. Most people who have gone out to dinner at 5.30 or 6 p.m. have seen kids seated with their parents with a pair of headphones on watching an iPad in the middle of a family meal. What do you make of that? Is that an etiquette foul? You know, it kind of depends, one, on the restaurant that you're in. I think we all know there's some restaurants, uh, I think I heard Le Bernardin mentioned, where I don't think that would be happening. <laughs> I don't think that's appropriate. I think there's others that are a lot more casual and really family-friendly. My take with that is if we've got the headphones on, so we're not playing a movie out loud and bugging other people, I would treat it the way you might a coloring book. I think I, I call it the digital babysitter, and sometimes that's a helpful way for parents to get in a bite and a conversation with each other. But if you're doing it all the time, then I think kids aren't learning to be part of the meal, and I think they're not learning how to be bored in an appropriate way, as in you know not bouncing off the walls because they're not occupied. I think learning to be bored, even if they're bored for a minute, um, is an important social skill that kids do need to learn, especially in a public setting. Let's hear from our guests on that, Spike. What do you say? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd have to agree with uh, with that. I, I mean, you know, you're, you're talking to um, a guy that, you know, is getting involved with a lot of food policy and a lot of food adv advocacy as far as children are concerned and, and that children need to know where their food comes from and appreciate it and, and actually uh, see the power of food rather than it uh, just an afterthought. Um, and I, I feel like uh, the dinner table is where it starts at. I think that's the important place where your family can get together. You can share each other's days. Uh, you can educate each other uh, over food. And, and I feel uh, a, a child, even at a young age, uh, as hard as it might be for the parents because, you know, it's, it's a children and, and, of course, you know, plugging, plugging him into an iPad may be the easiest route at a dinner table, but maybe a little bit of the extra effort on, uh, you know, taking s at least some of that moment at the dining table where you can talk food and educate your, your kid about food and how important it is and, you know, what's good, what's not, what, you know, what, what he likes and, and things like that. I, I think there's a, you know, there's a valuable uh, moment there. Uh, to educate kids, and I think that it's something that our uh, our generation uh, is missing, and it worries me. Tema, in general, I think that you know that's just one set of social skills training, uh, aside from everything else. And like when you're sitting down and eating dinner and having a conversation, and um, you know sitting correctly, eating properly, knowing knowing where your food comes from, um, is a skill that you don't know that you're acquiring and when you get older you're able to sit down at dinner and be socially active in a proper way and I think like I come from um, an engineering background and there's probably a lot of those guys grew up like nestled in their computers and when they get to engineering school and even outside of engineering school you can tell that there's a social aspect of their lives that's missing and I not that like it's all decided by you on an iPad one night in a restaurant, but if you do that over the course of, you know, your whole life, that probably adds to your social unawareness. Jessica? So I actually witnessed this exact scenario you just described at Little Cero, which is a <laughs> very adult restaurant where you don't usually see kids, but there was a couple with a toddler, and they set her up with an iPad, and she watched... Wally with headphones throughout the whole dinner and at first I was thinking what what is going on this is you know is this going to be distracting is this like, who brings a kid to little Sarah and sets them up with an iPad but um you know she as a result she was very well behaved and she didn't disrupt my <laughs> dinner so there's that the coloring book analogy I guess is what suffices here on to the telephones to see what our listeners think about this Terry in Hyattsville Maryland you're on the air Terry go ahead please thank you for taking my call I just wanted to make a, a quick comment um, but what you were just saying uh, brought something else to me when I was raising my kids um, we had places where which were whisper restaurants yeah. if there was a linen and a candle on the table they needed to be quiet and when we went to McDonald's they could do whatever they wanted but um, my, my comment really is to the, um, the, 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 the statement about uh, when I go to your restaurant um, I'm renting the space I am renting the space yeah, do and, what you want and then if the person next to me is on the phone 
or taking pictures, they are now disturbing my rented space. And I, I'll tell you, I'm walking around, I just walked out of a store because I don't do conversations in stores or restaurants. <laughs> but anyway, I don't, I, I'll take my, I'll take this, I'll listen off the air. Thank you so well, much. Anna Post, does the environment matter? Our caller Terry says if it was a white tablecloth restaurant, then the kids have to behave themselves. If there's McDonald's, then they're there for fun. Yeah, I think it depends on what we're talking about in terms of behave yourself. I think good etiquette translates whether the place is formal or informal. So I think in terms of social skills and what you would expect of kids um, in terms of engaging with the meal, I think both uh, uh, you know Tim and Spike touched on the social side of a meal. It's why you get together and eat with other people is to interact. And so at least for that portion of the meal, yes, I think that kids need to be able to be you know polite and engaged. And frankly, I'd expect that at kind of like a more casual place. Um, you know, or a more upscale to show kids that that's consistent throughout. Now, in terms of whether they get a few minutes to go and, you know, kind of run around, get the little, I don't know, I haven't been to fast food in ages, but I, there used to be like, you know, um, whole playgrounds inside some of these places sometimes. You know, yeah, some of that will be different, but in terms of, you know, kind of loosening up a little bit, but expecting this from kids and you know it's good to practice every now and then at home dinners first which you know I still think are really really important ways to connect with your kids and to teach them good manners um, you know and to teach them how to socialize what do you talk about at the dinner table you know practice that because if you go out to fine dining and kids have never had to sit quietly you know expecting them to be able to change right there in the moment is a losing battle here is Kelly in Bethesda Maryland who I think owns a restaurant Kelly you're on the air go ahead please Hi, Kojo. Great show. Um, kind of a silly topic in my mind. Um, I am a foodie. I'm a patron of, of restaurants. I, I happen to co-own four up in the um, outskirts of New York City. And um, I think a restaurant that would ban the use of photography is just crazy. Um, I, you know, yes, you have to be courteous when it comes to cell phone conversations, and those should not be um, those should be very brief, if at all, at a dinner table in a, in a public setting. But photography is the highest form of flattery, and I've never seen a situation as a, as a patron or as an owner where I would discourage that, and I would avoid any restaurant that prohibited it. Um, I think these folks that are prohibiting it, the, the restaurants, the owners, the chefs, you're just taking yourself a little bit too seriously. Well, there's... Um, there's several aspects of that issue that I would like to address, Kelly, so hang on the line for a second. First, you, Spike, you know, people eat with their eyes first, it said. Can you talk a little bit about the aesthetics of your dishes and why you wouldn't want those aesthetics photographed because you take so much time in preparing them? Well, well first, I'd like to say, uh, you know, the, the best way of flattery for, for a restaurant and a chef is uh, seeing someone really enjoying their meal and having great conversation. Not sending a great photograph. And, right. and not taking pictures and, and not. So, like, the greatest form of flattery is when you see a table that's in the zone and they're really, really, really enjoying their experience. So, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's, uh, that's the greatest form of flattery. And I don't prohibit pictures of my restaurants at, at all. I let people do whatever they want. Aesthetically, um... You know, it, it, it's that's true it, because Shepherd is basically a bar. Yeah, so Shepherd is not a restaurant. It's 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 a bar. It's a it's a small, small, small bar, hidden bar, <laughs> very dark, dark bar. Um, the, not the place you're taking your kids. Yeah, right? not the place. You're taking, hopefully not. Uh, I, I have to say, aesthetically for the food, uh, again, it's it's a lose lose situation. Uh, I I don't think you uh, you know chefs and, and owners should waste their time. Um, getting angry or, or upset about the way uh, an Instagram photo looks like or, or tweet, a tweet or, or what have you. Um, sometimes, to be honest, some of these photos end up uh, being helpful. You know what I mean? I've seen a, a couple of burgers that look a little raw on, on, uh, on, on the Twitter page, and I'm like, hey, uh, guys, you, you, know, you better, better start cooking the burgers a little bit more because they're, they're looking a little raw. You know, there's valuable information you can pull from social media. Uh, as owners, and you know, when you have multiple restaurants, and I have I have seven, sometimes these are very helpful. Do you know? I I look at the tweet and I forward the email to my PR or my management. And I'm like, guys, uh, you know, this person didn't enjoy their service, or this person's burger looks awful. Like, why did you build it that way, or or what have you? So uh, I think it's you know, there's two sides to the story, and and uh, you know, all we're saying is is that 
let's not become such a you know cell phone driven uh, culture where we're just constantly keeping our heads down and looking at a screen and, and not enjoying uh, what this beautiful earth has to offer us. Well, Tim and Jessica said when I saw some survey that says that it now takes twice as long to complete a meal in a restaurant as it, as it did back in 2000. Okay, can I interrupt you on that one? First of all, that story was never proven as a real story. It came from an anonymous restaurant and never confirmed. And it was on Craigslist. And it was on Craigslist. <laughs> um, but I, and I, in my reporting, I asked a lot of chefs, is it taking twice as long? Is this true? What do you is really Is it taking think? any longer at all? And I think the general consensus was it, it might take a little longer, like Tim was saying, maybe maybe 10 minutes. I think that's, uh, you know, max. But not so much longer that it's really affecting their business or bottom line, I don't think. It, it's hard to deny that it's, you know, it's not taking longer because you think about the dining process these days. Is you get to the restaurant, you sit down, you get out your phone, and you check in, and then you check Yelp. And then you look at the menu, and you get on Google, and you look up menu items and menu um, descriptions to make sure uh, what's Sudachi, what's Yuzu. Um, and, and then you get the meal, you take a picture, and like to add up all that time, yes, it's 10 minutes. And like in the case of... And then like, there's a mid-meal selfie. The mid-meal selfie. Right. That you have yeah. Yeah. And, and then like at the end, <laughs> yeah. you get your server who's in the weeds, take a picture of me, OK, <laughs> take multiple here, 10 phones that we got to pass around to get the pictures. Uh, and then it gets out of hand. Um, and when you look at it as a business, and in the case of like Maple Ave, where the turns matter, you know, it's nine tables, and to be even profitable, you got to turn multiple times a night. And when you're adding ten minutes or whatever, that could be the difference between, you know, eight or if it's like twenty minutes, eight and eight twenty, and people don't want to wait until eight twenty. They want to sit down at eight because otherwise that means an extra twenty minutes for the babysitter. Um, so it does affect it when you're on a certain scale, whereas water wall is completely different, big enough that you know you can you can sacrifice the 10, 20 minutes. What do you say about those delays, Jessica? Uh, I mean, I think I, I think that's fair. I talked to a lot of people about this, and um, I think overall the consensus was that it was if it was longer, it was it was such a small amount that it didn't really matter. Uh, but I think for the more upscale establishments, it does. Maybe you're not. Um, maybe you're on your phone, and so the server doesn't, uh, you know, bring out the course. And then it gets cold, and it's a fine dining restaurant, so they're gonna remake and replate everything, and that's gonna take longer. Um, or you know, they they see you playing on your phone, they don't come over and take your order right away, or something like it's that. It's also you know, our our business is a is a business of pennies. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you really have to track e every single penny, and it could mean mean uh, the big difference of what your bottom line is going to be. So when you're when you're looking at ten minutes, you know I, I don't think the chefs or the restaurateurs are looking at that one day, that one ten minutes. You're multiplying it by a year, right? And how many minutes of of this the photography or what have you in a small restaurant specifically? When you know, it's harder to achieve a, a, a better bottom line, it, it's over the year. Then there's some some profits actually some some major turning of tables some major dollars that weren't spent uh, that add up to be a lot of money someone's salary uh, an employee uh, and that's a lot to us at the end of the day when you're running a business running a restaurant that's a lot of money. Anna Post etiquette questions are much easier when there's a clear definition of what's acceptable what isn't what's rude what isn't right now these questions are somewhat subjective. How do you coach businesses and individuals to talk about their policies? You know, the most important thing is to be clear about what you want. Um, that's a manner in and of itself. Manners are just social expectations and some change over time, um, some don't. Some, you know, some, I think how we like to be treated, being treated respectfully with courtesy, with, um, you know, consideration. Uh, you know, I think that's really more timeless. How that gets expressed does change. So today, you know, living in more of a point of change, I think it's important that people make it really clear what's expected. And, you know, if if I understand correctly from um, one of the the articles that I'd read about this, you know, for example, heading to one of these restaurants in the elevator, you're it's mentioned to you, you know, by the way, no photography in here. I think that's really important. You know, you can't just come up and scold somebody when 
they thought that maybe the rules were something else, that this is okay. You know, now you've got an angry, you know, offended, defensive diner on your hands, and that's no good for anybody. I think it's really important, um, you know, on the customer side to always opt into your environment. You know, if you know that a restaurant has no photography or no cell phones, then you need to abide by those rules when you go. You know, their house, their rules. Um, but on the flip side, you know, I think it is important to be clear about what's expected um, and to try to be courteous in correcting people who make a mistake with it, you know, rather than, not that I think anybody's doing that here, but, you know, rather than getting nasty about it. But the more that you can be clear up front about the expectation, the more people can decide where they're going to die. And, you know, we heard from one person who said, I'm not going to go there. I think there's a lot of people who might instead choose to go there because they're like, yeah, you know, that sounds like the kind of experience that I want to have. Or more importantly, that's the food I want to have. And sure, I don't mind putting my phone away. Like the silent car when you're traveling on the train. Here's Brian in <laughs> Fairfax, Virginia. Brian, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, I just want to ask you guys a, a quick quick question. Have you ever thought of installing like a cell phone check at the beginning of the, the meal? Um, Treat it like five hours? <laughs> like check your cell phone before you sit down. Yeah, you I know, mean, there's a bar that does it in L.A. I forgot the name of it, but, uh, you know, and then there's also uh, Steven Star, a lot of Steven Star's restaurants uh, at the front of the restaurant. They have, a, like, a cell phone charging post and somewhere where you can actually lock your phone and you grab a key or there's, like, a code or, or what have you. And I think those are cool. I think being responsible for someone's phone, like, and demanding, it's very, you know, someone's phone at this day and age is very personal. So saying, hey, you have to give me your phone on entry and, and I have to lock it away. That might be a little bit too abrasive, but offering the charging post or the, the locker, I think, can be kind of cool, and, uh, you know, we, we talked about that. So, yeah, I think that that's a cool idea. Got to take a short break. When we come back, we'll continue this conversation on uh, smartphones, food photography, and dining etiquette. You can call us at 800-433-8850 or send email to code at wamu.org. How has technology affected your rules of good behavior at the dinner table? Are the rules of good etiquette timeless, or are they shifting with technology? 800-433-8850. I'm Kojo Nam. Welcome back. It's a Food Wednesday conversation on dining, etiquette, smartphones, food photography. We're talking with Anna Post, co-author of the 18th edition of Emily Post's Etiquette and the spokesperson for the Emily Post Institute. Anna is the great-granddaughter of Emily Post, the original doyen of American etiquette. She joins us from studios at Vermont Public Radio in our Washington studios. Tim Ma, chef and owner of Maple Ave Restaurant in Vienna and Water and Wall in Arlington. Spike Mendelson is chef and owner of four DC restaurants in including Good Stuff Eatery, Bernays, and We the Pizza, his most recent establishment, bar, speakeasy-style bar called The Shepherd. That has a no-calls, no-photos policy. And Jessica said, 
president who violated that policy, his food editor <laughs> and young and hungry columnist of Washington City paper, Rebel Jessica recently account. wrote about restaurants love-hate relationship with smartphones. We're inviting your calls at 800-433-8850. New York Times restaurant critic Pete Wells wrote a, well, I guess interesting article on this topic last month, and he posited that we are witnessing a new genre of cooking which he calls camera cuisine. He argues that chefs are changing their cooking styles and presentation with an eye towards looking good for Instagram. And he also says that some of these restaurants are sacrificing taste in order to come up with really cool looking plates. How does the camera affect the way you design menus and recipes, Tim Ma? You see that all the time, where you see somebody taking pictures of the food and you're like, okay, they're blogging, they're you know, a secret critic, or they're just, you know, posting on Instagram, and sometimes they have, like, big cameras, big lenses, and, and like, I'm guilty of it, too, where, you know, okay, what can I do to make this dish prettier, because it's not pretty, you throw an edible flower on it without doing anything to the edible flower, and you send it out, and you're like, that did nothing for the dish, um, in, in terms of taste, but, okay, guess what, that's the only piece of uh, the plate that has color, and... It, for me, you know, and for the most part, minus this edible flower occasionally, um, you know, the, the taste is the final thing, especially at a, you know, at Maple where it's, it's a lot more casual. Um, you put out a place that tastes good, and that should speak to the restaurant, not so much, okay, this, you know, this pretty plate with 15 components, none of them make sense together. Um, and you see that all the time. And it's pretty, and they, they look awesome, and it gets people to the restaurant, but it doesn't get them coming back, which is kind of the more important right. part. You know, I, it's interesting. I, I, um, you know, I, I didn't have a chance to read that article, um, but um, I would be surprised if serious chefs are really, uh, you know, uh, are really adjusting their uh, food plating to make sure that... Uh, they ensure an amazing Instagram photo or, or what have you. You know, uh, I've worked in a lot of restaurants for many years, and, you know, I, I, I've always had that moment in the kitchen when you're, you're you know, it's, it, it's, it's like you're plating something, and, it's, and, and you're making it look good, and, and then you back up a couple feet, and you look at it, you bend <laughs> over a little bit, and you're like, okay, and then you're like, that looks, that looks like a sexy plate. And for me, that's enough. You know what I mean? Knowing that that sexy plate is going to hit the table and then that guest is going to look at it and be impressed because people do eat with their eyes first, uh, I think that's why chefs uh, make food look gorgeous because in, in the course of dining, people eat with their eyes first, then they smell, then they take a bite. Uh, and I think that's something that, you're, you know, if you're, you're trained classically or not classic, it doesn't really matter. The same rules apply. I don't think... Uh, uh, Instagram or Twitter are really driving, uh, you know, this thing about chefs trying to make food look good. I think that was already instilled before even smartphones were, were existed. So Jessica, because the food looks beautiful, doesn't <laughs> have to be tasty. That's I mean, how it looks always matters, but how it tastes always matters a lot more. Um, and as an example of um, a local restaurant that is taking in, in the camera ready cuisine into a, um, account, Oval Room, which has been around for 20 years, they recently um, underwent this million dollar renovation and reopened. And they've really been encouraging people to take Instagrams and, and videos and have decided to do all these table side preparations that would make you want to shoot a photo or a video of it. And that, I think, was, was the goal of doing it table-side so that people will want to capture that moment. We should, we should develop an app that we literally sit in the kitchen and right before they get their food, <laughs> every guest gets an Instagram photo of their plate that's about to come to them. <laughs> that will save a lot of yeah. time. <laughs> and a post, it looks like a lot of restaurants <laughs> these days are doing all kinds of things to make sure their guests are not bored. Some blast music, some have TVs by the bar. What do you think about that? You know, there's an experience for everybody. You know, I'm not a sports bar, uh, sports bar kind of girl myself, but I get that, like, lots of people love that, and that's the outlet that they want. So, you know, I love that there's variety for people, but I think the kind of trend that you're talking about right there 
you know, has to do more with us checking out socially from the people that we're with. And yeah, there's places that are great for that. And there's, you know, experiences that are great for that. But I think a lot of the reason, as I said before, that we usually dine together is to interact with one another. Um, and for me, that's always the main goal. You know, I talk about this if it's, you know, I teach a lot of business etiquette seminars to corporations. We talk a lot about the fact that, like, look, if you're with the client, this is the person whose attention you want. Why would you ever divide yourself from that? You know, for me, it's the same thing with my friends. You know, Burlington, Vermont, where I live, we've got just a killer food scene up here. And if I'm going out to dinner with my friends, you know, the last thing I'm doing is texting with people who aren't there. I mean, you know, I want to just immerse myself and enjoy that experience, enjoy that food, you know, hang out with the people that I'm with and really enjoy that. And I think, you know, a lot of those distractions may seem like you're satisfying the customer, but I think there's also plenty of people who don't need it, but now become distracted by it because it's there. So, you know, again, I don't want to judge too much because like I said, everybody kind of has a different, different reason why they go out. But for me, I think that if restaurants can kind of focus on, you know, to, if, if the idea is to focus on getting people to, you know, as Spike said, being in that zone and really enjoying their food, then I'd switch off the TVs, you know, stop offering the phone chargers. Um, but, you know, it's just, that's that's one approach. Here's Andrew in College Park, Maryland. Andrew, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, Gojo. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, I'm a, I'm 24 years old. I'm definitely a digital native, and I have my cell phone attached to me at all times. <laughs> But I think um, increasingly, just through my own self-experimentation and with my friends, I found that at certain times, my friends and I really enjoy not having the distraction of cell phones. I've hosted parties in the past where it was explicitly stated that the party was a no-cell phone party, that people had to turn in their cell phones in order to come into the party. Similarly, I've gone out to dinner with friends where we said uh, we had all our cell phones in the center of the table and we couldn't touch them. And more and more we're finding that we really appreciate these times where we don't have the distraction of our cell phones in which we can really talk like face to face and in person and not have the distraction. And I think, you know, there are definitely times and places where I want to have that, where I really enjoy not having my cell phone. But again, you know, if I'm at a, at a, just a, you know, not a really fancy restaurant, if I'm eating by myself, I do like to have my cell phone with me. And so I think, you know, I think it's, there's definitely a time and a place for, not having cell phones, which I really appreciate, and I think that's going to be increasing. But I think the tendency to ban them or to have, uh, you know, have un unspoken rules about not having cell phones, I think is a little silly. Anna, what if you're dining alone? This is not really a socializing experience. Yeah, the tree in the woods, right? Um, I'll be honest, I travel a lot for business and I will sometimes read on my, my iPad. Um, but I do it if it's not a crowded restaurant and I'm kind of more away from other people. To be honest, you know, does that even really matter? Um, it probably doesn't, but for me, you know, part of etiquette, as I said before, is about being respectful and, and considerate and, you know, I, and opting, as I said, into that environment. And if you're there to be eating, then if, if me being on my iPad, you know, might be distracting to other diners, then I want to kind of, you know, minimize that. But yeah, there's well. a, I think, you know, the caller hit on something that to me is a really, really important point. Um, and he, he kind of got it at one way, and I'm going to get it at another, which is the attention we give to other people. Yeah. You know, I mentioned that etiquette is about your interactions with people and your relationships and being respectful and considerate. One of the ways we demonstrate respect in our actions is by giving people our full attention. And you really know when someone's not giving you all of your attention. You know, you may be on your phone and you think that you're, you know, um, active listening, you know, oh, uh-huh, uh-huh, mm -hmm, while you're, you know, going with the thumbs and getting back to somebody on the phone. You know, you think that you're fully paying attention to both things. I really, one, don't think you are, but even if you were, uh, you don't look like you are to that other person at the table. Part of you is checked out, not giving full attention. And I think the equation, you know, goes perfectly into not giving full respect to that person. And that's why it bugs us, you know, when people do it, even though it seems like kind of a small thing. So for me, if you just kind of extend that into the whole meal, um, I do think that it kind of is disrespectful to the other people at the table. And, you know, if everybody at the table wants to be on their phones, well, great, but why are you going out to dinner? <laughs> <laughs> well, Tim, Spike, Jessica, I'm just curious. What are some crazy things that you have witnessed being done all in the name of getting the perfect camera shot? <laughs> uh, I've, I've definitely seen what I would call obscene camera setups. Um, I've never seen a tri <laughs> I've never seen like a tripod in the restaurant, but it's just like where the the lens is bigger than the camera, and he's standing up, and his wife is 
posing with the food, and she's trying to hold it while it's not slipping off the plate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like that, that to me, and, and all this the while you're you're in a tiny restaurant, and everybody's just watching you. Um, and you know that's in one way is annoying because everybody stops from eating and food's dying and presentation's not going the way it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, you know, I, I've heard of other stories where tripods are involved. And <laughs> Have you seen tripods? Uh, no tripods that I know of. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'd have, I did have a table that Larry took uh, forever uh, taking pictures of, uh, of their, uh, their food and... Uh, Ended up returning their food to the kitchen because it was uh, it was cold. <laughs> the oh. bad How yeah. about you, Jessica? Well, so I have my own set of uh, photo taking etiquette rules, um, and one is not to bring a huge camera with a lens that's <laughs> giant, <laughs> it's bigger than the actual camera. Uh, you can just use your phone; it takes great photos. Um, I stand have up on your the, chair? No, don't stand up on your chair. I have also what I like to call the other five second rule, where, which is basically take your photo in less than five seconds. You can do it. You can do it, people. Yeah. Uh, it does not take five minutes to get a photo. Um, and then also, I think... Is that the same five seconds when the food hits the floor? Unrelated. I mean, they could be related, I suppose. <laughs> after you pick up the... Pick that photo, after the, yeah. From yeah. the floor, and then you can take the photo. <laughs> um, and then wait until after dinner to post it on social media. Um, I, I see a lot of people... Who you know, they they take the photo. Maybe they take it quick, but then they spend all this time like picking their Instagram filter and tagging their friends or whatever. Uh, I mean, you want to remember the experience, the the meal, but you also want to experience the meal. So you can do that very quickly, and then later when you're at home, upload the photos. Yeah, and I'm afraid that's about all the time we have. Nobody likes. Bad food photography, not your followers, not other diners, and definitely not the restaurant where you're eating. So, at the very least, if you're going to take photos, make them brief and make them good. Jessica Sidman is food editor and young and hungry columnist with Washington City Paper. Jessica, thank you for joining us. Spike Mendelson is chef and owner of four DC restaurants, including Good Stuff Eatery, Bernays, and We the Pizza. His most recent establishment, a speakeasy style bar called The Shepherd, has a no calls, no photos policy. Spike, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Tim Murray, chef and owner of Maple Ave Restaurant in Vienna and Water and Wall in Arlington. Tim, good to meet you. Thank you. And Anna Post is co author of the 18th edition of Emily Post Etiquette and the spokesperson for the Emily Post Institute. Anna Post, thank you for joining us. Thanks. Great to be with you again. Thank you all for listening. I'm Kojo Nand.
5 News. <laughs> Our weather forecast. Oh. Welcome back to our. Good afternoon. You're listening to WAMU 88.5. I'm Matt Bush. It's 1221. Starting August 10th. Good afternoon, you're listening. Crane, where she was. Namdi show. Namdi. Okay. At Bush, it's twelve thirty. Tea Party coming up Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to our conversation on Welcome back. Quick, subtract 356 from... 